Um, thank you very much. Um, okay, we're good to go. So I might just start very quickly with a little about Tasmania. Um, so population about half a billion people. It's highly dispersed, albeit there are four primary urban centres, one in the south, um, one in the north and two smaller cities in the northwest. The terrain is uh, in many areas mountainous and hilly and a lot of our water is pumped. And for those of you who run water businesses, not always great when you're trying to run a water business, particularly with old mates. Um, one of the uh, challenges for us, and this is, I'll talk very briefly about the importance of benchmarking at some point, but we, we learned uh, a few years ago when we participated in a water service uh, uh, Association of Australia benchmarking that we have an extraordinary number of assets. Uh, I, uh, I, I can tell a little anecdote later about uh, just how I learned that the hard way, but uh, we did this benchmarking and we compared, this benchmarking comes up in 30% of New Zealand's customer base, pretty much I think uh, 80, about 80% 80 of Australia's water utilities and customers. We found as little Tasmania with 2% of the revenue nominally, 2% of the customers, we had 38% of the water treatment plants across all of those jurisdictions. We had 37% of the sewage treatment plants, we had over 300 dams, um, it was just extraordinary. And then I started to realise, right, okay, I think I now understand why I'm experiencing some of the challenges. Um, I looked at Ravine slide and just could see some of the, the asset numbers there. But for example, you know, we have 900 pump stations, every one of them a potential to spill. Um, so I look at the scale of Ravine and some of the column they're looking at. We've probably got a lot less customers, but many, many more assets. And that plays out when you're reforming in a big way. Um, I might move on. So why were the reforms uh, actually, why did they take place? Put simply, the primary driver was in 2005. Engineers Australia ranked water and sewage around the country and Tasmania had the worst water and sewage in the country by a country mile. I think SCAR was A to F and we got F. Um, in uh, the regulatory model was deemed to be too light-handed and um, there was a third driver, what the, the state government of the day and the councils wanted access to federal funding, they could only do that if they complied with what was the National Water Initiative at the time. And in 2006, a ministerial task force was set up to develop a new model. So the situation prior to the reforms, quite frankly, there was just inadequate investment, inadequate funding, 32 bodies managing each managing water and sewage infrastructure. The asset conditions were largely unknown in many cases. I've heard about data uh, and the importance of data. I'm again going to reinforce that to you from my own personal experience. Uh, it is critical. Um, you get on top of the data as quickly as you can, and probably a mistake we made. Um, so we had asset conditions that were unknown largely, and we are still working through that um, because we have so many assets. Very poor sewage compliance. And probably the thing that, that I under—I came in in 2013, really we underestimated. Um, the customers and the, the majority of Tasmanian people were not engaged in the issues. So it was great, we had a ministerial task force, we had, I'm sure we had conferences like this, it was terrific. But for most people they said, well actually, water comes out of the tap, it's okay. Yeah. Press the button, it's okay. I don't see my water bill, it's all hidden in the rates bill. And then all of a sudden your bill starts climbing when the new water businesses are formed. Meters are introduced. No one's really sold the thing. And that has plagued us for 10 years. Five years of the initial reforms, another five years. Because the customers that were not directly impacted still don't understand what it's all about. And I can take some accountability for that in the last few years as well for being the typical, uh, typical engineer. If I do a great job, the business does a great job, everyone will know it. Don't be stupid, Mike. That is absolute <laughs> nonsense. Get out there and communicate and engage. Because if you don't, you will suffer like we did. Um, going on, uh, other reasons, uh, or sorry, how were the reforms implemented? So simply, new legislation introduced in 2008 um, two, two sets of new legislation. 
Four corporations were set up, so you're right earlier with three corporations. There were three water and sewage regional corporations, but there was also a common shared service organisation. Um, set up with independent skills-based board. Just put quickly, it was a compromise, it was a political compromise. I think it did, the regional corps did a great job with very little resources, but the reality is we probably lost two or three years in the corps. Whatever you put in, please start with your end goal in mind. Know what you want to achieve up front and be brave and take the fight on. Now, I'm not saying our politicians weren't brave, they just couldn't get the councils there. And, and I think it cost in terms of people's jobs, it cost in terms of the lost time in the reforms, um, so I'd strongly recommend you think carefully about the end game when you start. Um, uh, we, we, uh, uh, when the reforms were implemented, so we moved, we brought in much tighter regulation, far more scrutiny. Um, each corporation, though, still was owned by councils. So the region, the councils came together and they became the owners in each region, uh, which, which had, you know, did produce some good things as well. So I'm moving pretty fast, I recognise that, but I want to leave a little bit of time for reflection to the end. So in 2013, um, the government of the day, <coughs> largely, I would argue, championed by our chairman of the day, who's still our chairman, uh, drove merging four corporations into one. Um, and from, from my, my perspective in the current situation, just to give you a bit of background where we're at, we've invested about a billion dollars since the reform started. Right? So a small state, that's big biggies. And when I came into the job, this was one of my uh, immediate learnings. I'm, I'm a guy who likes, I'm an engineer, so I'm really hands on. I want to know what's happening, so I a big, bold opening statement as CEO, as we all do. We all regret them, but I'm going to visit every site we own. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, a year later, I'm still going to visit every site we own. Um, but what it did, I drove around all these sites. Water treatment plants, just, and I, I'm not an I'm an electricity guy, that's where I was coming from. And I went back and I said, about eight months later, I said, who told you a billion dollars? Oh, who told you it would take a billion dollars to fix this? Because I reckon you factors out. <laughs> and right now, as I said, we spend a billion, and over the next 10 years, we'll spend a billion and a half. And the reason I give you that is, that I'm, I'm not saying the consultants who did the job did a bad job. It's much more complex than it looks. Remember, water services, assets, mostly in ground. Not easy to get condition assessments. Um, and of course, that has had a massive roll-on impact on prices, as you can uh, you can understand. So please be cautious with your estimates. Um, think about what you know, I would be working on scenario-based thinking around what cost might be. Um, I might just keep going. So a couple of other things. Current situation. Um, all our boil water alerts, as of two months from now, will all be removed. All dripping water, it's all good, it's all great. Um, but interestingly, and, and I'm proud of that, we probably took longer than we should have, but we got our act together and we know how to do it. But they're not actually the ones that worry me the most. Um, after all of that, they're the ones that the politicians worry the most about. Well, water alert, terrible, and it is bad for the reputation, but what scares the hell out of me is the number of barriers. Right? What I mean, where are the barriers? Right, to stop an incident occurring. And so in the next three years, we, we just adopted health based targets, heard a little bit about it earlier, early on and said, that's where we're going because our next three years, I want to be able to sleep at night. And I, I can assure you, Marcus, uh, you think you've got issues? We have too many of colo strikes and it has been an issue some nights. Actually worrying about, are we going to have deaths here? Um, so our focus is on next two to three years, We've got an accelerated program. Largely, we will be compliant with health based targets. And that is what will allow me to sleep at night because we will have adequate barriers. And as said earlier, it doesn't matter how good your systems are, don't think they're not vulnerable. We also have been looking closely at Havelock North and what lessons there are for us. Um, so we currently have a long term plan, long term strategic plan in place. What matters is our regulators have endorsed it. They work with us on it. Um, it provides stability. 
In terms of funding, we now we know how to fund our program going forward. Um, so we have the cash, we have the financial model, we have the support um, to go forward. Um, our OPEX is growing, and this is a real issue when you start bringing things together. Compliance, it's all just cost. Someone's got to pay, so you've got to offset that cost. I think I heard someone talk earlier, our focus has been um, every new plan, every compliant cost, we have to find ways to offset it. So we're, so far we've generated $20 million in annual savings, and I still think we've got a long way to go. And we still have perception issues with the public. It rains, water just comes out of the tap, why am I paying these increasing bills? We have not sold the message and it wasn't sold early enough that the customers don't understand the value of the reform. And I cannot um, <coughs> state that uh, enough. Uh, communicate, communicate, engage with the community, make sure they're part of the journey, make sure that the customers are actually inputting into your priorities. There are some things that are non-negotiables. Um, and they, they're pretty smart. Our customers, when we went back to them, told us, number one priority, drinking water, drinking water, drinking water. We want it to be safe. Well, that makes it easy. Uh, but then the next lot, what comes after that, going to be more challenging. Um, doing for time. Benefits of current arrangements. Um, clear direction. We know where we're going. We pretty much know how to get there. And finally, we have all the players on board, I think. Um, and I'm going to just briefly talk about that in a minute. It was said earlier by Colin uh, Ravine as well, and I have to reiterate it, scale matters. And the reason it matters is not just the finance, it got good outcomes are driven by good people with core skills. You want the core skills, you've got to be able to attract them, having scale and often enables you to attract great people and great people create great outcomes. And that's been a clear benefit for us. Um, alignment, we uh, in Tasmania, um, we have great alignment with our 29 council owners. We work well together, we run it as a, a incorporated organisation where you know, they're the big shareholders like any other public company, but we didn't have great alignment with the government. We had three years, it was great, and then we had a major barney with the government, well, our owners in particular. Um, they wanted to take over the company, and so I'm not going to bore you with all the politics, but they had some legitimate reasons as well, but a lot of it was political. They couldn't make a business case, long story short, didn't get up, but we've all finally come together sensibly and said, government needs to be in the tent. So they're taking up a 10% shareholding, they get special rights. Finally, we're all working together again, and I think that's a fantastic outcome, because it sort of leads me to the next or will lead to later on a little bit on collaboration. So we have very strong regulatory oversight, I have to say. When I first came into the job, um, I was a bit anti What are all these regulators doing? Probably Marcus and I wouldn't have seen eye to eye. Um, but I have to say, um, it has provided transparency, accountability. Pra our, our regulators are pragmatic, but they know what matters. And they have been a big driver in, in driving successful outcomes for customers. And I've actually converted to be a bit of a, further, a fan of good regulation. Um, and I think the other benefit we got, we're very KPI and customer focused, as you want your water business to be. And, and those things are changing rapidly, but foundations take time to build. That's all the good stuff. So let's talk about some of the not so good stuff, the challenging stuff. Um, You've talked about it here, it, it's the value equation for your customers. Price versus, price versus fixing infrastructure challenge. How fast, how much, what standards do you want, work them out early. If you don't get this right up front, you're probably going to pay for it later on like we So engage, again, my recommendation is make sure your customers are on the journey with you, um, that everyone understands there are going to be trade-offs here. What trade-offs are you prepared to make and make them early. Focus on the, we, we still are overcoming perception issues on value for money. Um, and again, that's, you know, I've got to accept some responsibility for that, but I would argue, um, that, and this will continue, it's changing rapidly now, it's taken us too long to work out. We've got to be out there communicating. We still have too many assets. Um, whilst we have a lot of good skilled resources, our capital program is rapidly accelerating. 
Um, and that means I'm still challenged by the number of projects, project skills or what I actually need. Um, how do we fund it? I realise I've only got five minutes and I'm going to move quickly through these last ones. Basically everyone contributes. The only one that probably hasn't contributed as much as the federal government in our model. Um, hopefully with a new arrangement we'll get a bit of that. But everyone took some pain. And the corporation had to take pain and it will still have to keep finding savings. Impact on councils. Look, I heard an earlier discussion about how you deal with winners and losers in effect. You know, who maintained their assets well, who didn't. Can I advise you, don't spend much time on it. Work out a model that gets roughly there because I can tell you five years on as CEO, um, every council I go to tells me, we did a great job. It's a shame about those other 28 that never looked after their assets. That's where your problem is, Mike. And I can tell you individually, but pretty much every one bar one uh, will tell me that. That been this many years on. And I say, I'm sorry, but you're a collective. Um, and they will agree, 29 together in the room, oh yeah, you know, we probably didn't get it right. But individually, no, it wasn't us. So you can spend a lot of time going down those rabbit holes. We took the view, it's about the state. It's all, and for you, it's about the country. And that's got to be your overarching objective. What's best for the country? And yes, I'm sorry, there will be some winners and losers. You'll spend five years trying to get it perfect, I guarantee it. If you, if you really focus on that, you're going to have to make some compromises. Um, so we, we found a way of keeping councils largely whole. Um, that was an end result, but it's not perfect and they've accepted. So I wanted to just finish, hopefully I finished with four minutes ago, so that's good. I, I sort of, in putting this together, and I, um, I must thank, I think it was Jim uh, who sent me a set of questions to answer, so it was very helpful um, for, for my pack. I just thought I'd give you some reflections um, on what I, I think matters, and I, I want to open with something someone else said, um, so I'll pick someone else's couple of lines, but there is no perfect model. There is no cookie cutter model. Honestly, there's not. Um, um, there is a model that suits your circumstances, this is my experience, speaking for me, that suits your culture, uh, that suits your objectives. So I heard it earlier, and I'm not sure who said it, it came in a bit late, but focusing on your objectives up front, understanding your situation, develop a model for you, and then I would say to you, do exactly what you're doing now. Get out there. One of the greatest things I think we did, and, and my chairman, two years into this business, getting my head around it, my chairman and board said to me, Mike, I don't think you know enough about what it's still. And, and I had a range, and I'm a bit tight, so I had a range of trips to look at some new technology in, I think, um, somewhere in Europe, Eastern Europe, but I was just particularly interested. I wanted to go in, three days, get on the plane, come home. That was my intent. I thought the board would love that. <laughs> it might cost all million. The board said, no, you're not doing that. You've gone at least five weeks. We want you to go and visit as many different places as you can, because this has all been done before. All these lessons have been learnt. Now we went mad and I took someone technical with me to make sure I actually understood the answers. Um, but we, I think we were gone five weeks. I went to Germany, Holland, UK, <coughs> fabulous, um, Singapore. And we came back and we reshaped our strategy. And that has delivered, that trip has delivered such extraordinary value for many years. Because everyone's been there. You know, what I was talking about earlier with the model, it's not about a perfect model, it's about avoid, take, avoiding repeating everyone's mistake, picking up the best from everyone else, putting it together, and we just got such value. So I, I wanted to just reflect on that. Um, um, I talked very briefly about um, collaboration. Government and councils have to arrive at a model where there's clear roles and accountability for each have all got to be in the tent together. If you're not, it's not going to work. It's going to be very difficult in the early days. Um, would be my experience in here. Independent, skills-based board, professional management, absolutely essential. Um, we don't allow councillors, we don't allow politicians on the board. Doesn't happen. Because we knew that would mean funds directed in the wrong areas. Um, you must have senior executives, at least some of them with real change skill, 
real transformation skill. It is a skill. It's challenging. Um, you've got to be very resilient, and I think you have to have some experience. Um, collaboration, listening, flexibility, absolutely essential. No room for ideologies would be my advice to you. Listen to what others are saying. Understand where they're coming from. You'll get there a lot quicker. And as I said earlier, best for state, or in your case, should always be best for country. Um, the value for money case, it must be made for the customers early on. Don't, like me, assume they'll just get it because you're doing good work. Because <laughs> my experience is they won't. Um, learn from others, I talked about that. And I should also say, um, one of the great opportunities in the water industry, and I come out of the electricity industry and do reforms there previously, is it was very competitive in the electricity industry. The water industry is so wonderfully collaborative. We're about to, in my business, we're just ramping up our capital program, moving from 100 million to 130, we have to be at 200 million in the next few years. I've spoken to nearly every major CEO, or CEO of every major water business in Australia to learn from them before I introduce our new alliance model. You just, the value you'll get in this industry, if you're prepared to um, engage, is extraordinary. There's no quick fix. That's my experience, there's no quick fix. You've got to be prepared to build foundations. It's not all going to happen overnight in the early days. Um, focusing, and I heard again earlier, another mistake I made, focus on the data. Get your data right as early as you can. You'll probably be surprised how bad it is when you pull it together. We were, still are, and I didn't focus on data early enough. Good data means good decisions on investment and it benefits customers. And my last point is um, good regulation, and I say good, good is working. The regulators must be fiercely independent, but they all also must be prepared to work with you. I meet with the regulators on a quarterly basis, I'm transparent, I share everything we're doing, and they tell me what they like, what they don't like, and we're all concentrated on our long-term plan. We all know where we're going um, together. That doesn't mean they don't find me, by the way, Mark, they do, from time to time, I do get, <laughs> and I get uh, hit every now and then, but we still keep talking to each other. Um, and and uh, I think, you know, I'll close with, it's about working together, that's been my experience, finding ways to work with people. So with that, I'm two minutes over and I apologise. <laughs> Thank you.